service started this morning. We're starting with joyful, joyful, we endure thee. Let's all stand and join and sing.
So good to have everybody this morning. Just a couple of other announcements. For those who are here in person, upper rooms are out in the narthex on the table. If you need your upper room this uh, quarter, please, please make sure that you get that. And then also this evening, about 9 o'clock, uh, around dark, uh, the Lookout Valley is having their uh, community fireworks show at the John A. Patton Center. Everybody is welcome to come. Uh, I'm sure it's always, a, it's always a wonderful show. I'm sure there will be a big crowd this year. So if you want to come out and be a part of that, I want to encourage you to do that. And let me say this before we go back and in, in, in sing some more. Is uh, invite somebody to come to church with you. Church is open. Did I say that? Yes, I did. Church is open. Bring somebody to come to church with you. For those of you in our virtual family, invite somebody to, to participate, your family or friends. Share the worship service on your Facebook page or on your, uh, on your YouTube. That way others can participate with us. You should invite somebody to come and be a part of what God is doing here at Wahatchee. And we're so, so excited about that. All right, let's do this real quick. Our affirmation of faith this morning. I want us to do this. We're having a communion today. And this is just a great tradition of saying our creed. And I do it this way because... For me, it's a little bit easier to remember, and it gets you responding, and I like to do that. Do we have that set up to go up on the screen? There we go. All right, let's do this this morning. For those of you at home, for, uh, please participate along with us. Do you believe in God? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Lord. Do you believe that he rose from the dead? I believe that on the third day he rose from the dead, that he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and that he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit. Tell me, church, what else do you believe? I believe in God's holy universe and church. church tradition and church history. If you go back to the second and the third centuries, there were people who were literally martyred for their belief and their recitation of the Apostles' Creed. It's a statement of faith. It's a declaration of what we believe in our hearts and in whom we believe. And so that's the importance of why still today we still do our creeds. Let's have another song. <laughs> Thank you. 
should have stayed standing for that one. Somebody say amen out there. Um, comes a time in our service to where we spend some time together in prayer. And uh, for those of you at home who are watching, we have a, a prayer list that is ever evolving that's uh, uh, maintained weekly. We have a prayer group that meets on Wednesday mornings at 10 here in the chapel for those of you that wants to come and be a part of the prayer group. They pray over the list. Uh, there's prayer list out of the narthex. For those of you who like to take them home, I encourage you to do so. Uh, we try to keep them updated weekly to the very best that we can. But if you're at home, if you have a special prayer request, you can put that request there uh, in the comment sections on Facebook or YouTube. Also, if you're using our church app, I encourage you to download our church app on your phone or your tablet. There's a prayer connect card uh, within the app that you can uh, put a prayer request in there. Uh, also, and It'll come to us. We'll get that on the list. And uh, I just appreciate the faithful, fervent prayers of God's children. And God honors prayer. He answers prayer. And uh, today, we just got some praises that I want to do this morning very quickly. Uh, I was uh, talking with uh, Ms. Gail Harold this week. And she is sharing with me. We've been praying for one of her neighbors, Rachel Grisham. She's been on our prayer list for many months now. She's been going through chemo and radiation for cancer. The doctor told her this past week that the chemo and the radiation has worked and that she is completely cancer free. She was giving the Lord a mighty praise and uh, I just love hearing stories like that. He was talking with Jeff just a second ago about his brother and uh, his brother's been in the SICU, been on, on sedation, and been unresponsive for quite a while. But this week, uh, they took him off the sedation. Jeff said he's been responsive a little bit, starting to respond to people, so we see a good turnaround there. We want to praise God for that. Um, Jerry Walls' daughter, uh, Ms. Melody, we started praying for her this past week, and she's been uh, pretty sick. Talked to Jerry Wednesday or Thursday, and he said that she was making a remarkable recovery. And she was doing much better. And we just want to praise God for that. So I tell you, prayer works, guys. It works. And when the people of God come together, and when we pray together for, for these, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. I want to encourage you this morning to keep praying for Miss Alice's mom, Miss Billy Dustin, that God will just continue pouring her grace and mercy out there. Uh, that situation that the Lord will keep loving on her and uh, being with her during this time. And Miss Pam, did you have something you want to share this morning? Yeah, I do. Um, Sandra Hawkins is in the ER right now, and she's one of our faithful prayer partners. And Sandra and I Let's remember Miss Sandra Harkis this morning. I hear that she's in the ER. Miss Pat was sharing with us. So I ask you, please write that name down. For all of you at home, there's a list going across the screen. You can write those names down. Just please, please, as you spend time with God this week in your daily devotions, get that list out. Pray for one another. Love one another. And that's what a church family does. That's what they do. So let's take this moment right now. Let's bow our hands, close our eyes, and spend some time in prayer together this morning. Lord, what a blessing it is to be back in your sanctuary, to your house, to assemble together with my brothers and sisters. Lord, to come and to worship you in spirit and in truth. You are amazing. You are so kind, so loving, and so generous. But yet you are full of sympathy and care. And you care about us in ways that we can never fathom with our, with our little finite understanding that we have. Thank you, Lord, for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, your healing power. Thank you for hearing our prayers. And thank you for being intentional in a relationship with us. Lord, forgive us for not being the same back with you. 
like we ought to be. Lord, when they mention many names this morning, Lord, there's so many names that's on our prayer list this morning. God, we ask you to just your sweet saving power, Lord, that you touch each of these individuals. Father, we praise you for the praise reports we heard this morning. Lord, for Miss Sandra Hargis, Lord, you know how much we love her and what she means to us and how big a part of our church she is. God, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you lay your healing hand upon her. Help her to feel better. Father God, whatever's going on, Lord, don't let her be discouraged. Don't let her be downtrodden. Lord, if she's in any pain, take that pain away. Lord, give the doctors wisdom and understanding to help her this morning is our prayer. Bring her back to us, Lord, stronger and better than she's ever felt before. And Father, we continue to pray for our church, for the work that you're doing here at Wahatchee. Lord, we pray for vision. We pray for power, Father, we pray for your presence in the middle of what's going on. Lord, we pray that we may be a lighthouse for the salvation of souls, that we may be a university for the Holy Spirit to educate and to mature us. God, we pray, Lord, that our church can just be a help to somebody else, to help them to get to know you the way that we know you. Lord, we thank you for this this morning. Lord, help us. As we go through the rest of the service, prepare our hearts, our minds, and our souls for the reception of Holy Communion. God, may you be honored and glorified in everything that is said and done. For in Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Let's do our invitation, our confession, our pardon. It's on page 12 in our hymn books. For those of you that want to look at the hymn book, I think it'll be up on the screen as well as we get prepared to receive communion today. <clears throat> the invitation goes as this. Christ our Lord invites to his table all, somebody say all, all. who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and before one another. Let's do this together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to encourage us for this moment of silence. Take a moment there. I want you to spend some time with God. Reflect about the words that you just prayed. Clear your heart. Clear your mind. Let the Lord minister to you for these next few moments. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. All right, let's have another song.
song. Live for the victory, not the sadness, the victory.
Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Yeah, bingo. <laughs> Psalm 134. I'm going to read this to you and then uh, share a little bit with you this morning about what God's put in my heart. Psalm 134 is just three verses. The scripture says, Behold, bless ye the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. It says, to Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord that made heaven and earth bless thee out of Zion. As I read that passage of scripture, God just started dealing with my heart a little bit about this lifting of you. Lord, what is it that, that keeps us from knowing your fullness of the glory that you have? God, what is it that keeps us from receiving the bountiful blessings that you want to pour out upon us? Lord, what is it that keeps us from walking in the knowledge of grace and, and to be able to, to put a smile upon our face and to have our hearts overflowing with joy and with peace? God, what is it that stirs our minds and hearts so much that keeps us from the security and the affirmation that you want us to have from the very presence that you give us in our lives? Lord, what is it that keeps us from understanding and feeling the arms that you want to wrap around us? What shuts off our ears so that we may not hear your voice? What closes our eyes that we may not see your miracles? God, what, what restrains our spirits to where we may not feel connected with you like we need to be connected with you? Lord, what keeps us from raising a holy hand? What causes us to do this? I'm reminded of a story I read about a pear tree in the midst of a garden. This was written by St. Augustine. He wrote this back when he, was, when he was a young man and he was struggling to find his relationship with God. He wrote a book called The Confessions and one of those chapters of the book was a story of a pear tree in the midst of a garden. As a young man, he would play ball with his, with his friends. They would all gather together and they would have a good time. And they were out just being what we would say, just being boys. And they saw a pear tree in the midst of a garden. It wasn't their garden. It didn't belong to them or their family. But yet that pear tree there with all of its fruit stood in the midst of that garden. And those boys looked at that pear tree, and the longer they looked at it, they said, we've got to get those pears off of that tree. They knew it was wrong. They knew it was stealing. They weren't hungry. They didn't need it for substance. They weren't going to take it and sell it so they could buy themselves a bicycle or go out and buy a new catcher's mitt for baseball. They just wanted to get the pears off of that pear tree in the midst of the garden. And so they devised a plan, they broke into that garden, and they stole as many pears as they could possibly carry. And as they ran away, Augustine said, all I did was just throw the pears away. The joy had fleeted from me. This desire and passion I had to take the pear had left. He said, what was this inside of me that would cause me to do such actions? He said, he goes on, he tells a story in that same chapter about me in this same group. What would cause us to do the things that we did? We would find a, another young lad, lesser than us, and we would gain up upon him. We would beat him. We would scorn him. We would make fun of him. And we felt so elated and so joyful from the actions that we were doing. But yet afterwards, I found myself guilty of being a bully and of being hateful. He said, what causes me 
to do these things. He said, even in infancy, he said, I can't remember when I was a baby, but yet I can look at other children and see how they, other infants and see how they are. Even in infancy, I was selfish. Even in infancy, I, I, I wanted to eat when I wanted to eat. I wanted to sleep when I wanted to sleep. And if I made a mess and pooped in my diapers, guess what? I wanted you to clean up my mess. Isn't that just like we are today? When I want something, I want it now. And if I don't get what I get, I throw myself a tantrum and a fit until somebody succumbs to my will and satisfies my human desire. He goes on and he talks about when he becomes older, as a young man, how that now he realized the beauty of young girls and how that he was overcome with the lustful eye and, and the desirous feelings that he had in his body. And he wrestled because his mom was a Christian. Her name was Monica and she prayed for him daily. She constantly begged of him, have you found the Lord yet? Are you going to church? Are you reading the scriptures in which I've given you? And she would pray and she would weep. And, and, and it got to the point there to where he, he becomes so convinced that he would find reasons not to call his mom, not to communicate with her. Why? Because he knew that once he did, all she was going to do was just speak of him of God and he would feel convicted and he would feel guilty. Does not that sound like us today? He said there was something inside of me that I realized that was evil. There was something inside of me that I realized that was sinful. There was something inside of me that I realized that was not of God. It was keeping me from God. It was keeping me from knowing God and being blessed with God. It was the stain inside of me. It was my very humanity causing me to be this way. It kept him from raising a holy hand of praise. The Bible says in Isaiah 59 2, it says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear you. Our depraved, sinful nature is something that we carry with us daily. It's a struggle that we all have to bear. It's that cross that we must pick up, up in the morning, and we must crucify that old flesh and lay it down. Why? So that we may walk in the new man, and the Spirit of God may thrive and blossom within us. We ask ourselves, why are the church pews empty? Well, the answer is quite simple. It's because we're full of human depravity and human desire. Why do we not treat each other with kindness and respect the way that we ought to? Well, the answer is very simple. It's because we are depraved as human beings and we are sin sick within our hearts and our souls and we need to be cured by the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to have his blood to wash us white as snow and we need to have his spirit to correct us and cleanse us from all of these unrighteous thoughts and temptations that go through our minds. Paul said in Romans chapter 3, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good. No, not one. When we hear these things, we are reminded of the original sin that we were born with into this world. We were reminded that we had a void and a hole and a need because we were spiritually dead. And because of that spiritual death, that, that, that life that just ceased to exist within us, all we had was just this soul in this body. And it was just contaminated by the desires and the pleasures of this world. It keeps us from raising a hand of praise. I'm not talking about while you're in church and while they're singing. I'm not talking about a Pentecostal type worship. And, and, you know, I had a little bit of a discussion with my press professor about that. I said, I'm Methocostal. He said, do you even realize what you're saying? I said, you better believe it. 
I've been in the Baptist church. I've been in the missionary Baptist church. I've preached in the prisons. I've been, I've been in the uh, rescue missions. I said, I preach in all kinds of churches. I said, you better believe it. I know what that means. That means that I have succumbed to the very power and the miraculous workings of God. And if God tells me to shout, I'm going to shout. If God tells me to run, I'm going to say, Lord, let me tie my tennis shoes. Somebody say amen. If God tells me to raise my hand, I'm going to raise my hand. We cannot ignore the presence and the power of God. When we ignore the presence and the power of God, we find ourselves given over to this humanity that we are all plagued with. Consider the Consider the woman that was brought to Jesus. She was caught in adultery. The teachers of that day had brought her and laid her in front of Jesus, and they were all ready to stone her. And they said, Is it not the law of Moses that because she was caught in adultery that she should be stoned? Is that what Moses said? Jesus left, knelt down, and he wrote in the sand, and he said these words to those who were her accusers. Let who is without sin cast the first stone. What did they all do? They're all, their hearts were convicted, and they all dropped their stones, and they all fled. And right then and there, he said, woman, where are your accusers? I don't see them, Lord. He says, neither do I. He said, go and sin no more. I believe it was at that moment that that lady raised a hand of praise and touched the hand of her Savior. I remember the maniac of Gardaris. He was possessed with demons. He had superhuman strength. They had him chained to a tombstone. He wandered around saying all these different vile things. Then out of nowhere came Jesus. He was being brought to him by the Spirit of God. And as Jesus came into his presence, there was voices of legions that come from this, from this demon-possessed man and said, What have you to do with thee? And by the very power of God and the authority of Jesus Christ, he said, Come out of here. And they said, Where do we go? Send us into the swine. And Jesus sent those thousands of demons into the pigs. I believe it was at that moment when that man was freed and he finally had the consciousness of knowing who he was and the consciousness to have his own thoughts again. I believe it was in and he raised, raised his hand up of praise and he touched the one and set him free. I remember the woman with an issue of blood. She had visited all the doctors. She had spent all the money. She had taken all the medicines of the time. And for 38 years, she had this issue of blood. And it could not be cured. And she got to her breaking point. She got to the end of her rope. And she had heard a man who was going around. And because he was praying. He was praying and touching people. And they were being healed by the power of God. And she said, oh, but if I could just get close enough to him. If I could just get close enough to him, then I could just touch the hem of his garment. And she did. She found him. She fought her way through the crowd. She crawled her way in a, in, in, in a humble way until she got close enough to him and she reached out and she touched the hem of his garment. And instantly, because of her faith, she was healed. She raised a hand of praise. The widow's son, as they were bringing the son down the aisle, they were bringing him to the procession. They was taking him to be buried. He had died. He was all that she had. She was, he was her provider. He was her caretaker. He was the one who was going to protect her. And now she was all alone. And she wept bitterly. And she was so broken hearted. Broken hearted. And God and Jesus saw her. And he had compassion and empathy upon her. And because of the, of the widow's pain, he called out to that young man and raised him up out of that casket. I believe that widow raised a hand of praise. When Peter and the other disciples were on the ship and the storms had come, they all looked out through the fog and they saw a figure walking upon the water. And Peter said, Lord, is that you? Jesus says, it is I. Peter says, Lord, if it is you, let me come to you. Jesus said, come on. How many of us has Jesus told us to come on? Because of our little faith, because of our unbelief, because of our wavering in our own humanity, we refuse to step out of that boat and to walk on that water like Jesus said we could. Peter stepped out. He walked on that water. But as soon as he got out there far enough, he realized where he was and he saw the storm and the lightning and heard the thunder. And then he lost that faith. 
and he started to drown. But what happened when he started to drown? He raised a hand of praise. Lord, save me. <clears throat> I remember Martha weeping for Lazarus. He had been dead four days. He had already started to decay in the stink that they believed in the tomb. And as Jesus came up to her, all she could do was fall at his feet and weep. Oh, Lord, if you had only been here just a little bit sooner. And she raised a hand of praise. Lazarus, come forth. And that man walked out of that tomb alive. I remember as that Jesus was dying upon the cross. The Bible says that the skies turned pitch dark. And the earth started to tremble. And the thunderings and the lightnings of heaven started to roar as the voice of God. And it was in the midst of this moment, the very soldiers that had nailed him to the tree and pierced him in the side saw all these, uh, these natural phenomena happening. And they looked up at the one hanging upon the cross and they said, surely this must be the son of the living God as they raised a hand of praise after what they did to him. We raise a hand of praise to break the chains that we are filled with. Did you hear what I said? Too many of us have been carrying the same chain so long they've become rusted and they've walked with it upon themselves. We need to let Jesus break those chains. We, we confess the same sins too many times, over and over and over. Sooner or later, we need to let God break those chains. We raise a holy hand when healing is sought after. When we are sick or ill, or when a loved one is, is broken ill, what do we do? We pray and we lift our hands and we beg God for mercy. We beg the great physician to come and visit us or visit our loved one just that one more time that we, may, that we may witness the miracle healings of God. We raise a hand of praise. We raise a hand of praise when we are hungry and he feeds us. We raise a hand of praise when we have been in a battle, a spiritual battle like we've never been before and God gives us victory. It's out of that victory we say thank you God. We raise a hand of praise when we declare our faith. Are you listening to me? We do it because we are compelled to. We do it because God is so close. It's like we could just touch Him. We do it because we are making a proclamation to all of those who are looking at us. My God is amazing. And I'm raising a hand of praise to show you just how awesome he truly is. Jesus tells us in Luke 21, 28, he says, when you see all these things in this world starting to come to pass, just look at it. I've talked about this a million times. There's a spirit of Antichrist that's at work in our world right now, and he's at work in a way like we've never seen before. Crime is at an all-time high. They are dragging people into the streets and literally killing them one after the other after the other. I mean, you know, we sit here and we go, well, that happens in these big cities. No, it happened right here in our back door on Highway 58 in Chattanooga this past week. A man had road rage, got out of his car, and with a knife and stabbed a couple right there on Highway 58, killing the husband and putting the wife in critical condition. Evil is all around us. This hate that is going on has to stop. And the only way that this sin and this hatred can stop is if the people of God rise up and say, we are not going to take it anymore. We're tired of our politicians stealing from us and lying to us. We're tired of our neighbors being angry and told that they have to hate us. We're tired of suffering and doing without. We're tired of all these things going on. I'm going to raise a hand of praise and I'm going to turn this over to the Lord. And I'm going to ask God to straighten out this nation. I'm going to ask God to clean this nation 
back up. I'm going to ask for a revival to sweep through and for the Holy Spirit to convict hearts. I said this before. There's this, there's this movement now called wokeism. I've been woke for 52 years. I know in my heart what is right and what is wrong. And I know in my heart that there's no place for hatred in this world. And I know in my heart that I walk beside those in this world and they are my brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter what color of their skin. It doesn't matter how much money they have. It doesn't matter what things that they've done in their past. These are my brothers and sisters. And God has called me to love them. Them and to walk with them and to be one with them. There is no place for this mess that's going on in our world today. It's got to stop. Woo. I've contemplated in my heart. Is a revival even possible? Lord, does it take a rapture to wake your people up. Lord, does it take a rapture to actually stir the church out of slumber like it needs to be stirred? Lord, does it take a rapture to cause people to turn back to you? I feel convicted in my heart that we've got to preach and we've got to keep preaching. And we've got to share, and we've got to keep sharing, and we've got to show, and we've got to keep showing, and we've got to love, and we've got to keep loving, and then we cannot stop. There are too many people dying and going to hell. Yes, hell is real. People say, Pastor, what is hell like? Let me tell you what hell is like. First of all, tell me what God is. God is light. God is love. God is peace. God is joy. God is life. God is provision. God is satisfaction. God is happiness. God is good. Now you want to know what hell is like? Hell is removing all of that out of your understanding and your consciousness. Hell is being separated from that which is all of God. A place where there is no more life but the outer darkness. A place where there is no more peace but wailing and gnashing of teeth. A place where there is no more joy where it's this constant stream of agony and torment. A place where there is no more life where you die the second death over and over and over again. But preachers don't want to talk about it. They don't want to look up the word of God. They don't want to share the reality that there is life after death. And you have but two ways. It's been preached for 2,000 years. The apostles preached it. The saints preached it. The early church fathers preached it. And we have stopped preaching it today. May God have mercy upon our unfaithfulness. We're not sharing the truth of Almighty God. Ooh, where did that come from? May God have mercy upon us. You want to know what hell is? Hell is where God is not. That is what hell is. Imagine, right now you feel the wooing and the touch of God in your heart. Imagine going all eternity without hearing his voice or feeling his touch. The warmth of his light, the depth of his love, the, the, the feeling and the power of his grace, Imagine going for all eternity without him. That is why we do what we do. That is why we invite people to come to church. That is why we love on them and we feed our community. That is why we have a broadcast and we encourage people to share that broadcast all throughout this world. That is why we preach the truth, even in the face of, uh, of all of the, those who oppose us, we're still going to preach God's word. That's why we are Wahatchee. Amen. So as we take Holy Communion, as we Participate in the Eucharist. May it bring us together and may we all find it within ourselves to raise a holy hand to the Lord today.
Let's do our great Thanksgiving. Will it be upon the screen, Ms. Tessa? Oh, it's up here. I just can't see it. Okay, great. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by the water and by the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He drank from this knee. He said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for you and for me for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and of wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you have the bread, for those who are here in person, and for those who are at home, let us take the bread. This is the body of Christ, which was broken for us, that we might be made whole. Now for those that have to cup. Bless God, I love these little cups. Somebody say amen. I do. Bless the hands that prepare these in Jesus' name. This is the blood of Christ which was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. Amen. God is amazing. He is amazing. I'm going to ask them to come with a closing song. And as they come with the song, 
I want to encourage you right where you are. I want you to pray. This is how I want you to pray. Lord, help me to raise a hand of praise. Lord, help me to draw closer to you. If God's talking to your heart today, answer that call. Surrender to him. St. Augustine went almost 29 years fighting the call of life, the call of God on his life. And after he answered that call, it was so blissful. But he said these words, What have I missed? from running from God. What have you missed from running from God? Let us all stand as we sing.
What a blessing. You know, when I look out and I see y'all singing and praising God, it's like looking out at a, at a heavenly choir. It just fills my heart with such joy. And it just re, I just rejoice within me knowing that I have a church family that loves Jesus so much. I pray that as we leave this house today, that God will bless you, that he'll give you a happy, very, very happy holiday this weekend. And as you go through this week, remember, raise a hand of praise. Amen. Amen. Wherever you go.